Well, good morning. Hope you're having a great 4th of July weekend and uh, it has been a little little reprieve to the heat this week. We've enjoyed that, and uh, anytime we get a little reprieve to that, we, uh, we take it. Uh, it is good to be with you this morning. This, uh, this follow series uh, that we've been going through the last, we're about halfway through. And so if you're just now getting here, uh, you're kind of coming in at the middle of the movie, and so that means you have questions and you're trying to figure out what in the world uh, is going on. So I, I would invite you that if you have not kept up with all of these uh, messages up to this point, this is message number five. So you're four behind. So we'd love for you to catch up. We'd love for you to keep up. And you can do that in a variety of ways. One is by uh, logging on to uh, our website. You can link there to uh, YouTube and you can watch it. Uh, if you desire not to have to look at me, then that's fine. Uh, you can listen to it on audio version. And it, it's about, uh, it takes a little while to get through all four of those messages. So I've got a perfect plan for you. We're looking for volunteers to mow the grass out here. We've got a really nice zero turn mower out in the back that we'll be glad to teach you how to ride. And I'll hook you up, and you can sit and listen to all four messages. It takes about that long to mow this yard, so you can be caught up and serve the church mowing at the same time. And I'm talking about a double dose of blessing for you, okay? So if you'd like information on that, there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby, and you can sign that, and we'll put you on the mower and put the word in your ear. And that'll be a wonderful thing for you. So we'd love to have you help us with that. Um, as we have looked at this series couple things, and I'm not going to review the whole thing because it'd take too long, but, but the teacher in me always takes you back uh, just a little bit to review before we get started. And one of the first things that we established as we went through this series was that when Jesus came and Jesus began to call people and he began to ask people, he, he, more than anything else, what his request was, was to follow me. And, and, and these are the kind of people that he would talk to, that he would request to come and follow him. And the first thing that we find is, is that he didn't come to the religious establishment of the day and call them he came to folks just like me and you and what we find out is is that being a sinner it does not disqualify you from following Jesus as a matter of fact those are the people that he that he called and we find out that being a sinner is actually a prerequisite to following Jesus that's who he called that's who he came for that's who he called that's who he asked to follow and all of his disciples kind of fit that bill I fit that bill you fit that bill so being a, a sinner does not disqualify you it's a prerequisite for following Jesus. Another thing that we find out is that sometimes we're just not, especially when we're kind of new to this, and you may be new to this, and you may be trying to figure this whole thing out, and you may be asking yourself the question, and I just don't know if I believe it all. I, I just don't know about this whole thing, and I'm, I'm trying to, that's okay, because not being a believer was a prerequisite to following Jesus. None of the people who first followed Jesus believed in Jesus, because over and over and over again, he would ask questions, you know, or he would do something, and when he, he would do something, and then they would believe, and then they would waver in their belief. And this went back and forth for three years. So if you're not fully on board, if you're not fully convinced yet, that's okay. Because being an unbeliever is a prerequisite for first following Jesus. It doesn't disqualify you. So that's who he came for, and that's who he came to. And, and, and last week, we talked about, you know, if you're going to be a Jesus follower... What do you wear? <laughs> you know, what are we supposed to wear? We talked about, you know, other people that follow uh, basketball teams and football teams. They make it pretty, pretty bold who they're following. So if you're going to follow Jesus, what do, you, what do you wear? And Paul told us what, what we should clothe ourselves. And we found out that it wasn't made of, of cotton or, or wool or fabric or polyester or anything else. It was things in our spirit that we need to clothe ourselves with. We should be clothed with compassion and humility and kindness and gentleness and patience. And that's what we talked about last week that you're supposed to wear if you're going to be a Jesus follower. We talked about if you follow Jesus, where is it going to lead you? And, and, and last week we talked about w what you're supposed to wear. But today, here's the thing. <laughs> you know, when you're trying to witness to somebody, when you're trying to get somebody to come to church, you know, one of the things that you use uh, in doing that, and, and, and maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe somebody invited you, maybe somebody, and, and what they told you was, hey, you should come to church, okay? If you, if you can become a part of living faith, then your life is going to be better. If you become a Jesus follower, your life will be better. And, and here's the thing, that's true. You know, it, it really is true. If you become a Jesus follower, your life will be better. I promise you, your life will be better if you become a Jesus follower. There's lots of benefits. Some of the nicest people, some of the kindest people, some of the smartest people I know are Jesus followers. So I, I could list for you a whole list of things, a whole wonderful uh, list of benefits of how awesome it is to be a Jesus follower. Now, here's the thing. If I'm selling you something, okay, if I'm trying to convince you to, to, to buy into something, if I'm trying to convince you to do something, I'm going to give you all of the good stuff, right? 
I'm going to lay it all out and say that you're going to be a better person and your family, your kids are going to be better and all these things are going to be better for you. And then you're looking at that going, that's all great. That's all great. That's all great. And, and what you're asking always, when somebody's trying to show you something that's going to be wonderful and it's going to be great and everything, aren't you always in the back of your mind thinking, how much is this going to cost me? How much is this going to cost me? Where's the fine print? Okay, well, here's the thing. Salvation is free, and we'll find that here in a little bit. That's not what we're talking about. But there is a price to pay to follow Jesus. And, and, and today, you're going to find yourself asking yourself this question. Am I a Jesus consumer, or am I a Jesus follower? Are you following Jesus, or are you just along for the good stuff? Okay? Am I a Jesus consumer, or am I a Jesus follower? And we're, we're going to set this in the context of a teaching that Jesus did. If you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn to Mark chapter 8. If you have your phones or whatever, it's, uh, you can go to your, uh, your YouVersion Bible app. If you don't have that, I really in, in, in encourage you to download that. If you've got a data problem, just let me know. I'll put you on the web here at church and get you on Wi-Fi, and you can download it for free. It won't cost you anything. So it's a great thing if you've got... If you're one of those users, you should have that uh, so that you can do that. But Mark chapter 8, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And, 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 here, and here they go. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them this question. Who do people say I am? What are people saying about me? That's pretty brave, isn't it? Okay, Be careful asking that question. Okay, especially to my daughter, all right? Uh, Michaela will always tell you exactly what she knows, all right? That's just the way it is. Some people are brutally honest, aren't they? And, and so if you ask that question, who do people say that I am? What are people saying about me? And Jesus asked this question, who do people say that I am? And so his disciples responded with what they were hearing on the street. Uh, they said, hey, some people think you're John the Baptist. I mean, he was recently beheaded. They think you're reincarnated now and that you're that going on. And some people say he's Elijah. And other people call you one of the prophets, there's a lot of chit-chat out there, Jesus. There's a lot of talk out there. He says, okay, all right, okay. But who do you say that I am? What about you guys, all right? But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Uh, and Peter's always on the front row. And he, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. It's me. I got, it. I got this. You're the Messiah. You are the Messiah. And Jesus said, wow. Well, Okay, you're right. He says, you're right, but don't tell anybody. Okay, it's not time yet. God's revealed this to you, but uh, don't tell anybody. Okay, it's not time yet. It's not, it kind of sounds confusing to us, doesn't it, in, in the age that we're living in. But at that moment, in that time, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And then he goes on. He then began to teach them. He's got his disciples here. He's telling them. He says, this is, this is what's getting ready to happen. The Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. And Peter says, time out. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is not going to work. Um, <laughs> Peter takes him beside, aside, because Peter's listening to this and is like, Wait a minute, chief priests, hey, look, hey, this is about the Romans, Jesus, okay? Come on. The, the Roman, Romans have invaded our country, and, and they've taken over everything, and, and, and so you're the Messiah, right? And we're going to drive these guys out. And, and if we're going to do that, we're going to need their help. We're gonna, you need to quit, you know, you bash, you guys get into it a lot, and there's lots of bashing that goes on, and, you know, we're going to have to kind of buddy up with them, and we're going to have to be friends, and we're going to have to get along, because this is, it's going to be, and he said, hey, you know, none of this, so Peter takes him aside and begins to, he's like, Jesus, come here, Look, can I get a word with you? Hey, uh, you know, I, th enough with all this dying talk, okay? Come on, hey, you can't die. I mean, you're the Messiah, okay? Come on, look, look at the crowds of people. There's a lot of people here, you see all these people? Lots of people. And, 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 you know, and you're famous. And because I'm right here with you, I'm kind of famous. And, and, you know, John, not maybe so much, but, but you know, I'm pretty famous, and, and people love us. And, and it's really cool what's going on. And we don't need any, don't go negative on me, man. Don't, get, don't go negative on me. Don't talk about this dying and all this. Thing. Let's go back over there and teach on prayer or something positive, okay? Let's be positive about this. Come on, man, you, got, you can't go down this road. Don't go negative on me. Oh, look what Jesus does. Jesus, when he turns back to his disciples, he rebukes Peter. 
and says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Wow, why so harsh? You know, why so harsh? Peter's like, come on, man, don't get negative on this. Oh, let's talk about, about dying. You know, what are you, what, are you, what are you doing? And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. This is what he says. Peter, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter, you're a Jesus consumer, man. You're not worried about me dying. You're worried about what's going to happen to you if I die. You're, you're in this for you. you you're, you're worried about you. You don't have the, the things of God in your mind. You're worried about you. And you're worried about what benefits you. Yeah, this is a great ride. People are showing up by the thousands. We're feeding people. We're healing people. And you're just right here with it. You're a consumer. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I mean, come on. You like this, don't you, Peter? Well, you're Peter. <laughs> You know, you're the big guy. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. There's a lot of people in this for what they can get out of it. You see, he's looking at this crowd, and it's like, there's lots of people out here that are here to see what they can get out of it. But Peter, Peter, I want you to be my follower. All right? I want you to be my follower. So get behind me. Get that, get that worldly stuff out of your mind. And, and here's the thing. What he's trying to say to him is, 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 you know, when I go somewhere that might not be so pleasant, when I go somewhere that might be difficult, I don't want you to abandon me. It's just what they wind up doing, isn't it? See, when it gets tough, I don't want you to turn your back on me, Peter. I want, I want to know that you're with me. Because he exposed something in Peter and exposes it in us. That we're worried about what's going to happen to us. And so he has Peter here. Jesus is brilliant. Okay, And he's just, this is a brilliant, he's, he is the great and ultimate communicator. He has Peter in this place. And, and so he decides to use this as a teaching moment. Okay, he, he, He's exposed this in Peter. So Peter's here going, you know, I'm trying to get him from being negative, And now he's rebuked me and called me Satan. And so now here I am, okay, not feeling so well at the moment. And so Jesus turns to the crowd. So he calls the crowd together. He's like, everybody come in. Y'all have a seat. Everybody gather up. Everybody come in. Disciples, you guys get on the front row. Peter, you sit right here, okay? They get right here. So he calls the crowd to him along with his disciples. And this is what he says. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, that's pretty powerful. And what Jesus is doing here is he is revealing the fine print. He is revealing to them the real cost of being a follower of Jesus. He reveals the fine print and says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is an eyeball-to-eyeball conversation with Jesus. Looking these guys right in the eye. The crowd is right there behind them. And he's eyeball-to-eyeball saying, Look, guys, if you really want to do this, if you really want to be my disciple, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. He's going to tell them that he's about to be arrested, tried, and crucified. And here's the thing. In that day and age... And in that time, if you followed along some, with someone too closely that's about to be arrested, tried, and crucified, you might be arrested, tried, and crucified with them. And taking up your cross meant something to them. Okay? Now, to you, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm not sure. And, 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 and here's the thing. I'm trying to sort all of these things out. Most likely, your cost, okay? Most likely. Your cost of following Jesus will not be literal crucifixion. Understand that, okay? I'm looking at a crowd of people. The, the chances are, <laughs> if you make the decision to follow Jesus, the cost of following Jesus is not going to be literal crucifixion. For some of the people that were sitting in front of Jesus, it was, okay? It was. Take up their cross. If you're going to make the move from Jesus consumer to Jesus follower, 
He says, you must deny yourself. Whoever wants to be my follower. Now, you understand the concept of denying yourself, whether you know that or not. Okay, you guys understand the concept of denying because everybody in this room at some point in time have, has done. You've made a decision to deny yourself. Okay, you, most of most of us have done it with food. Do you want this piece of apple pie with the with the with the with the ice cream on top? Yes, I would love it, but I'm not. Okay, and, and I don't know how many of you guys, all of you, if you've ever been to a restaurant and ate, you know you you've had a big meal or whatever, and then and then your server comes up to the table and says, "Did you save room for dessert?" And you're sitting there going, "Oh, I want dessert so bad," but you're going, "Oh no, no way." I can't do it, okay? I really want it, but I'm going to deny myself, and I'm not going to have it, okay? So you've done this, okay? If you grew up in Troy Richards' house and you were one of his children, you understand what it means to deny yourself, okay? Because he would take his children to the, every time they would eat, he would take them in and say, two items off the dollar menu. But Dad, oh, no, two items off the dollar menu. You're going to learn to deny yourself, okay? This is the way it's going to be. So because he's cheap, uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and so I can pick on him because he's leaving. Um, you deny yourself. Because here's what, here's what this means. To deny yourself is to say no to you. Okay? To deny yourself is to say no to you. So when you want something, when you want to experience something, when you want to have something, and you say no to yourself, then you're denying yourself. Okay? And you guys have done that. You understand what that means. And this is what Jesus said. If you're going to be my follower, you're going to have to say no to you. He's saying there's going to be moments, okay? There's going to be moments in your life. There's going to be attention, okay? There's going to be moments in your life when you're going to have a decision to make and you are going to have to deny yourself for me, okay? You're going to have to deny. So they understood what this meant. And then take up your cross. Now, here's the thing that's hard for us. He says, take up your cross. Now, I don't know what your experience is with the cross. But I can assure you, at best, it's limited, okay? We have one here, and it's pretty. It's polished wood. Uh, it has, you know, a spotlight on it. And it's very, some of you guys have these around your neck, and they're made of gold, okay? And, and so we, we, I, we, we kind of make this thing uh, special, and, and we, we kind of sugarcoat it a little bit. And, and, and here's the thing that, you know, you've seen it in movies. Maybe you even watched The Passion of the Christ, and you're like, come on, now that's pretty rough. Yeah, but there was music playing in the back, and you could mute it if you needed to. You could turn your head away. Get this, okay? Crucifixion is horrible. And if I started describing it for you in detail, some of you would have to leave the room. You couldn't handle it, okay? None of us have ever seen it real. None of us have ever smelled it, okay? None of us have ever observed it. These people sitting in front of Jesus and his teaching knew full well what take up your cross meant, okay? They had seen it. They had smelled it. They had observed it. It was horrific. Rome used it as a torturous death, and, he, and they would leave the bodies hanging on the crosses until they rotted as a, as, a, as a reminder and as a deterrent to get people to do what they wanted. So the, the mention of cross to these people would have just struck fear into their hearts. And Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple, you must first of all say no to you, and then take up your cross and follow me. This is where the crowd kind of starts thinking about checking out. Okay? This is where Jesus' consumers begin to waver a little bit. Hey, wow, take up the cross. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I really have enjoyed the show. Uh, it's been great. I loved all the miracles. That's pretty cool. My, my child was sick. You healed her. That's awesome. Uh, my mother-in-law was sick. You healed her. I wasn't too sure about that, but you did anyway, so that, I'm fine with that. It's okay. Uh, you know, and the free food is awesome, and we really enjoy the miracles and all the things that's going on, and we watch other people's people get healed. And, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know about the cross thing. That seems kind of heavy. That seems kind of big. That's a Jesus consumer. This is what you begin to ask yourself the question. And, and, and for some of you, this is your question. Okay? Because at one time in your life, it's not a question of whether or not you believe in Jesus. It's really not that question. It's not the question of whether or not you believe he died on the cross. It's really not a question of whether or not you believe he died for your sins. It's not a question of whether you've asked him into your heart. But here's the thing for you. This is, this is real for you. It, at one point in time, you said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a Jesus follower. I'm going to do what it takes to be a Jesus follower. And it costs you something. 
And you had to ask yourself this question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is this pain that I have to go through, is denying myself the things that I have to deny myself to be a Jesus follower worth it? That's a tough question, isn't it? Is it worth it? Jesus knows the hearts of man. And he knew knew their hearts. And he knows your heart. And he knows my heart. And he's brilliant. (laughs) He's brilliant. And he knows what they're thinking. He knows exactly what this crowd is thinking. He knows what his disciples are thinking. What's he talking about? Man, this is great. We're having all this, you know, fish dinners and all these things that we're doing. And all these great crowds and all these. And he's talking about dying. And I don't know if that's worth it or not. And Jesus knows the hearts of man. So he puts his invitation to follow him in a little broader context. I'm telling you, this is brilliant. Verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life. Isn't that you? Hmm? Yeah, it's you. You know it's you. Look at what all you do to save your life. You try to eat better. You take medicine. You go to the doctor. If you get sick, you go. Okay. You get in your car. I bet you put a seatbelt on. Okay. I bet you bought a car with airbags. I bet you looked up the safety rating on the car. Why? Because you want to save your life. It's just who you are. It's who I am. It's just what we do. I mean, we try every way we can to save our life. Who, who's not going to be there? For whoever wants to save their life, and who is that? That's you. It's, it's everybody that was sitting in front of Jesus. It's everybody sitting in here today. You'll want to save your life. You'll fight for your life. You'll fight for your life. Whoever wants to save your life. And then he goes on and says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. In the same sentence, you're sitting there going, yeah, I'd do anything to save my life, but, well, I'm not going to live forever, am I? No, you're not. No, you're not. We can't stay here. We don't know how long that's going to last, but we can't stay here. We're all going to lose it. We're all going to lose it. I'm telling you, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is brilliant. I mean, whatever we try to do, no matter how I eat, how much I exercise, no matter what I do to improve the quality of my life, it may lengthen my life, but ultimately, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. I can't stay here. So no matter how many bad habits I break, whatever I do to save my life, one day, I'm going to lose it. But he goes on. He says, okay, well, so if you're going to lose your life anyway, and everybody's in that same boat, he says, think about this a moment. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Well, wait a minute. So if we're all going to lose, you know, what you're telling me is that, that none of us get out of here alive. None of us are going to make it out alive. We're all going to lose our life. But you're telling me there, there's a way? There, there's a way that I can lose my life for you? There's a way that I can lose my life with purpose? Whoever loses their life for me. So whoever loses their life, that's everybody. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. Jesus says, I, I, know, I know I'm scaring you to death. I know this is scaring you to death. But I want you to understand the end game here. Okay? I want you to understand the end game. And, and so he, he leads them into a series of, uh, of, of questions here that, that helps them to come to this place. If you, lo- if you follow me, he says, then you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to lose something of value. But you're going to lose it anyway. Okay? You're going to lose something that's important to you. You're going to have to deny yourself of something that's important to you. But you're going to lose it anyway. You're going to lose it anyway. So I'm giving you an opportunity to lose it for purpose. He says when you come to that place of decision and you have to give something up you have to give something up to follow me what i'm telling you is is that you're going to save it you're going to save it so they're contemplating this and like you're contemplating it right now but he goes on he poses this question to them verse 36 so what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. What does it mean for you 
to gain the whole world. What does that look like for you? What does it look like to accumulate the world? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? I'm not sure what that looks like for you, okay? Um, <laughs> you, you, may, you may want to buy airplanes. You may want to have an island. I don't know. Maybe you're more simple. You just want a farm, nice house. What is it for you? What is gaining the whole world for you? What does is, what is, what is that look like? You know what that looks like. You know, you know, you have your ultimate life in mind. If I could have whatever I wanted, then this is what it would look like. And Jesus says, what good is it to gain all of that? But at the end of your life, and you had a great life, you had traded away. You had forfeited your soul. Now, here's the thing that you have to understand. Okay, In his time... Uh, there was a group of people, there was kind of a debate among religious leaders about the afterlife. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees taught one way, and the Sadducees did not believe in the afterlife. Okay, And, and so they, they were kind of like, look, you were you, they believed that you were created by God, and that you were created for His pleasure, and you lived out your life, and when you got to the end of your life, you died, and that was it. Okay, That was the end. So they did not believe in heaven or the afterlife whatsoever at all. And I'm sure that's why they were sad, you see. So that's a little Bible humor. It's free. Okay? You can use that tomorrow. But these people who were sitting in front of Jesus, okay, they were debating this. And Jesus says, some of you believe that there is something after death. Some of you believe there is an afterlife. And I'm here to tell you, you're right. Okay? You are right. It is true. Okay? It is true. And I'm telling you that what good is it for somebody to gain the whole world, yet trade away your soul? And here's something to think about. 97% of Americans believe in heaven. 85% of people in this county are not in church today, but 97% of them believe that there's heaven, that there's an afterlife. But yet we make decisions to gain the world, and we gamble with our soul. Now think about this for a moment. Think about this. Jesus doesn't say exactly what that means in this context. But I think what he means is when you get to the end and you've gambled away your soul, you forfeited your soul in the, in, in, for, for wealth. You see, some of you have seen the Christmas story about Ebenezer Scrooge and, 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 and you, you saw how he was so greedy and he gathered everything. And You don't have to be like Scrooge. You can be happy and gain things. Okay, you can live life to the full and, and just really enjoy everything that you do. And, and, and like we've said many, many times, if you're if you're not enjoying sin, you're doing it wrong. OK, because it's fun and that's just the way life is. And, and so when you just live your life in such a way as to gain the whole world. But Jesus says, what if you did all that and then you get to the end of your life and you had traded away eternity? And then he poses this question in verse 37. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Now, here you go. You've lived your life to the full. You've done whatever you've, you've gained the whole world. And now you've come to the end of your life. Okay, Now you're at the end of your life. And now you realize that you have forfeited your soul. It's hypothetical. Okay? But you've forfeited your soul. You've traded away your soul. What would you give to get it back? You know the answer to that question? Sure you do. Everything. You're not even going to bargain. <laughs> okay? Because what good is it? Whoever wants to save their life is going to lose it. And so you can gain the whole world and you get to the end of your life and you've traded away your soul. And Jesus says, what would you give in exchange for your soul? And the answer is everything. 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 What would you trade to get your soul back? And Jesus is the brilliant communicator. He just lays it out. What good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? It's no good. It's no good. And what would you trade to get it back? I would trade everything. And now Jesus says, look at what you've discovered about yourself. 
Look at what you have discovered about yourself. Those of you that are afraid to follow me, those of you that heard those words, deny myself and take up my cross, that started wanting to backpedal a little bit and say, I don't know, is it worth it? Is it real? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? I'm not sure. What would you do at the end of your life and you had traded away your soul? Those that fear taking up their cross. And this is what you learn about yourself. And he, know, he, and he knew that about his crowd that was in front of him. And he knows it about me. And he knows it about you. That you are willing to trade everything to save your soul. If placed in that decision. If placed in that decision, you are willing to trade everything to save your soul. You consider your soul more valuable than every one of your possessions, don't you? He knew that. You consider your soul more valuable than any possession that you have. Now, folks, if you've never come to that place, that is a powerful, life-changing moment for an individual. If you have never crossed that path before, if you've never come to that place and asked yourself, what do I value above my soul, and have answered that question, nothing, that can be life-changing, and maybe that is for you. And I'm sure it was for a lot of the people who were standing in front of Jesus at that moment. And Jesus says you must deny yourself, and take up your cross, and follow me. At the outset, that seems like a lot. But lead, Jesus leads us to an understanding that denying ourselves and giving up things now, it somehow affects us in eternity. He doesn't get specific, but verse 38, this is what he says. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. There is a day coming. He doesn't get real specific about it. But there is a time. It is going to happen. Are you a Jesus follower? Or a Jesus consumer? You see, some folks are right there saying, you know, I'm, I was just here for the miracles and the free food. <laughs> I really don't have health insurance, and so this was the best deal I could, I could find. And there's Peter sitting on the front row going, I'll never be ashamed of you. <laughs> You know the story there, don't you? Not very long after that, a middle school girl says, Aren't you one of Jesus' followers? Je who are you talking about? Je Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Don't know who you're talking about. You're crazy. That was Peter. And what did Jesus do? Kicked him right out of the group, didn't he? No. He said, I forgive you. Peter, don't do that again. And Peter did just what Jesus challenged them to do. Peter died for what he saw, a risen Savior. Peter died for what he saw, a risen Savior. So what is the moral of the story? <laughs> Simple enough. Salvation is free. It costs you nothing. And I'm so thankful for that. Salvation is free. It costs you nothing to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the reason it's, it's free is because he paid the price for it. Okay, He bought it. He bought it on the cross. He paid the price for it on the cross. And you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't do anything. Salvation is free. It costs you nothing. When you put your faith in Christ, it costs you nothing. But following Christ in this life, Following Christ in this life, in this day, in this age, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. Salvation is free. But if you follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. And you're going to have to come to a place, and you're going to have to make a decision. And I don't know what it's going to be for you. And I can tell you this, it's not going to be just once. There's going to be multiple times that you're going to cross paths, you're going to come to places in your life, and you're going to have to make a decision. And I can't tell you what it's going to be for you. You're going to be confronted with a situation, and you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to choose. And when you make that choice, you're, asking, you're answering the question, am I a Jesus consumer or am I a Jesus follower? Because to follow Jesus, 
it was going to cost you something. For some of you, you're going to have to let go of a dream. You're going to have to let go of a dream. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to deny yourself something. For me, I didn't even know why. I didn't even realize that God was tugging at me when I was a teenager. I didn't understand it at the time. I didn't understand what he wanted me to do. I was full of myself and full of ego. When I was in high school, I got a call and, uh, to come to the guidance office in September of my senior year. And I went down, and Miss Dorothy Bennett was sitting behind the desk in the guidance office, and she said, they're looking for somebody to work at the radio station in Hartford. And I, I, I gave them your name, and Lloyd Spivey wants you to call him. And so I called him, and I went over, and he hired me on the spot. And so I started working at the WLLS 106.3 FM in the afternoon, reading the radio classified ads, you know, big deal. And, and that was my part-time job. And I thought, this is the coolest thing ever. You know, I am on the radio, okay? Me and my grandmothers were both listening to me, and, and it was so cool. And, and, and my real good friend in, in the FFA was Jeff Nally, and Jeff worked for the big station, the big country super station over in Orangeboro. And, 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 and so when I graduated from high school, Jeff called me, and he said, hey, I want you to come to work with me. And I was like, really? He said, yeah, I want you to come to work with me. He said, I want you to be my assistant farm director. And he said, I'm going to get you in the system being a, uh, in operations. And he said, then we'll work you through the AM side, and then we'll move you over to the FM. And he said, I want you to work eventually to be my assistant farm director. And I said, okay. And, and I remember going through that. And so I started to work, and I was like, I got my big break. I'm going to the big station, you know. So I, so I go to work over, and I, w I went from making $2.85 an hour to three thirty-five. Okay, so I'm moving up. Okay, and, and so now I'm driving to Owensboro, making three thirty-five an hour. Of course, gas was ninety cents a gallon or eighty cents, and, and, and so I'm driving back and forth. And and and, and so I, I started out in the AM station, and then I worked my way up to WOMI, and then and then all of a sudden they went they went live. Uh, they, we had a lot of automation in those days, and we only had we had Big Bill Love in the morning, we had John Baker in the afternoon, and that was it. And so we all had this little production meeting, and they sat down. They said we're going to go live twenty-four hours, and we want you to be our one of our guys. And so they hired. Uh, they hired Tony Mason to come and be uh, 7 to midnight, and they hired me to do midnight to 6. And I was like, oh, here we are. I got my big break. I'm on FM, okay? And so I was the last person to broadcast out of the old white radio station building on Frederica Street. And we moved over into the big new building, and I remember doing all that. And, and we came in, and I'd hit the big time then. You know, I'm in a $300,000 studio, and I'm thinking, you know, this is really cool, and I'm full-time with benefits, and I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to do radio, and I was working at the racetrack, and it's like, and next thing's MRN, and now we're going NASCAR, and we're just going to, this is going to be me, you know, and I'm really rolling. And, and I remember going through that, and I would work all night. And I would drive home and be dead dog tired, and I didn't adapt to third shift very well. And <laughs> we got to the summer after I'd been doing that for several months. And it was time to, for school to start in the fall. And I just remember looking at myself and thinking, where, where is this headed? Okay, where is this headed? And, and it was so hard to, to even think, because that was my dream. Okay, I really wanted to do this. And, and, I, and I had people that was, you know, and, then, and so then they sat down with me and they said, okay, here's our offer. This is what we want you to do. We want you to do live on the air from midnight until 5 a.m. And then at 5 a.m. when Big Bill comes in, you're going to do Jeff's farm reports from 5 until 9. So you're going to be on the morning show from 5 a.m. until 9 a.m. And I'm sitting there going, let's get here at 11 p.m. and leave at 10 o'clock the next morning every day. But I'm on the morning show. That's a big deal. I'm going to be on with Big Bill. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be in the morning. That's a big deal. And so I struggled back and forth, and I struggled back and forth. And I remember going to Bill's office, and I sat down with him behind, in front of his desk. And Bill's 6'8", 375 pounds. He really is Big Bill. And, and, and Bill sat there, and he, and he looked at me, and he said, you know something? He said, I just can't help but think that maybe there's something more for you. He said, you're welcome to stay here, and you're welcome to do this. He said, we think you'd be great at it. He said, but... I just can't help but think you're a young guy. You got your whole world ahead of you. You got your whole career ahead of you. And he said, "I just," he said, "I want you to think through what it's going to take to be a success in this industry. I want you to think about the nightclubs and the things that you're going to have to sell and the things that you're going to have to do in order to do this job." And he said, "Because I just don't know, you know." And I said, he said, you, you, got, you, you, should, you should go to school. And, and I'll never forget, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget that. I, I finally made the decision. I went in and sat down with him. I said, Bill, I'm going back to school. 
I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to go back and major in, in, uh, in communications, and, and I'm going to get my degree before I do anything to see what's going on. And, and I remember they, they hired uh, Dave Spencer, and Dave came in, and I trained Dave. He took my job. Okay, that's been 25, 20, almost 30 years ago. Okay, and, and so I trained Dave, and then they hired Kelly G, and I trained Kelly and showed her how to run things, and she was a whole lot better than I was at what she did, but, but she didn't know what a radio station looked like. And, and, and so we, I trained those two individuals, and then I remember going to Bowling Green, and I was like, I, have, I can't leave radio. You know, I've got to do something. I've got to have a part-time job in radio. So I went to every radio station in, in, in Bowling Green, and I applied to all of them. And Troy Richards was the manager of WCVK, and he wouldn't even hire me. And so I wound up at the Beaver, okay? Of all things, the biggest station in South Central Kentucky hired me. I went down and talked to Myla Thomas, and she was like, you're a BKR? Yeah, she's like, oh, you're hired. You just come. And so she hired me on the spot. And so I got a job at the Beaver, and, and, and I kept reducing it, but I kept hanging on to it. I kept hanging on to it. And, and, and I, I would change my shifts around. I'd be like, yeah. And I finally, I, the last thing that I did was a Sunday night show. And I did the Sunday night, six to midnight deal. And I was there one night. And I was just sitting there behind the board. And I was looking at, you know, the little needles bouncing and had the headphones on. And, and it hit me. It's like, you're doing this for you. This is all about you. This is not about anything else. And there's more, there's more to life than this. And I, I went to the typewriter. And I typed out a letter of resignation. And I put it on Myla's desk. And I took my headphones off, and I hung them on the microphone. And when the midnight guy came in, I shook his hand, and I said, I'm done. I'm not going back. I'm, I'm done. I walked away from radio, and I never went back. And I can tell you, when I go back now and think about that, I love that more than anything I ever did. I had so much fun, and it was so much fun. And, and, and I enjoyed going to work every day that I went. It was so much fun. But, but, but there was something inside me that told me that there's more to life than this. Because that was all about my ego. It was all about what I could do for me and my success, and my career. And it had nothing to do with making a difference in anyone else's life. And eventually when I came to my senses and finally figured it out, God said, I want you to teach, and I want you to preach, and I want you to use your life to make other people's lives better. That's what I want for your life. And I'm so thankful that I denied myself what I thought was my career. There have been times, even in the ministry, there have been times when I got called back to New Harmony, I was so happy... <laughs> I was so happy to go home. Man, we built that brand new building. It was so nice. My office at New Harmony, I could lean back in my chair and look out the window and see if goose, geese were landed in my goose pit. I mean, I had it made. I was home on the farm and I only had a two-minute drive to church. It was awesome. And God said, I got more for you. I need you to follow me. I, need, I know this is a good setting. I know this is your family. I know you're right here in your backyard. I know the chair's nice and the window's cool and that's your deal. And, but I need you to follow me. I need you to deny yourself that, that comfort. And I need you to follow me. And I don't know what that's going to look like for you. But when you follow Jesus, it's eventually going to cost you something. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to point out to you, you don't have to sit around and worry about this. <laughs> okay? You don't have to sit around and say, I don't know what it is that I need to deny myself of. Maybe it's ice cream or maybe it's you know, my job. You'll know. You'll know. You'll know. He'll tell you. It's coming. Something will come along. For some of you, it'll be a job. For some of you, it'll be a job opportunity. It'll be a job opportunity, and you'll look at that job opportunity, and you'll say, in order for me to do that job, I'm going to have to do something that compromises my faith. It's more money. The benefits are better. But I don't need to take that. I have to deny myself. For some of you, it's a relationship. For some of you, if you look at a relationship, and you say, that's, that, that, that would work. And then you look at it and say, but that's going to cause me to have to compromise my faith. That's a good question. When you, when you answer the question, is this going to compromise my faith? You better not do it. You better deny yourself whatever benefits it is. Maybe for some of you it's a business deal. And there's going to be something in that deal that you're going to look at and you're going to go, this is not right. There's something about this that's just not right. I don't need to do this. I need to deny myself. And I need to follow him. And for some of you, this is going to be your future. For some of you, it's going to be your future. Because we live in a culture, right now, we are, we're blessed, okay? All right? We're blessed. We live in a culture where our children have FCAs in their schools. We live in a culture where we have prayers at our graduation. We live in a, in a, in a small subculture here in Ohio County where we're able to do things that a lot of other places can't do. And let me tell you something. The longer you, you you're, <laughs> it's just not going to, when you've got this many people, okay, because we still have builder and boomer generation people that are, that are 80 and 60% saved. 
But let me tell you something, young folks, okay, hear me. When those people are gone, when those people are gone and you're living in a world that's only 10 to 15% church, your world is going to look different. Okay? And the cost of following Jesus in that world is going to go up. Okay? The cost of following Jesus in a world that is only 10% saved is going to go up because you are going to be persecuted. Okay? And more than anybody in this generation ever has going to be, because if you talk to a, a person who grew up back in, way back when, a, a builder, you talk to Audrey Emery and ask him, is there, was there ever a question you know, of, of the price of following Jesus? He'd probably say no. But I'm going to tell you something. For the millennial generation, you're going to have that question in your face all the time. Is it worth it? Is this really worth it? I hope you'll say yes. I hope you'll say yes. For some of you, that decision may be right in front of you right now. For some of you, it may be right now. It may be today. It may be today. You may have a decision facing you right now. And you're looking at that decision that you have to make. And you're asking yourself the question, is this the right thing to do? My question for you is, does it compromise your faith? Does it compromise your faith? Does it cause you to have to go down a path that you don't need to go down? Does it cause you to have to compromise the things that you believe? Does it cause you to have to do things that you don't want to do? If it is, you've got to deny yourself if you're going to follow him. My prayer for you in that moment, my prayer for you in that moment is that you'll be able to say, yes. Let me pray for you. Father, we come before you asking you to help us, to guide us. Father, many times we ask ourselves the question, is it worth it, is it real, is it worth it, is it real? And Father, <laughs> so brilliantly you placed it before us in your teaching. So brilliantly you laid it out so that we ask ourselves the question, what are we really doing trying to hang on to our life? What are we doing trying to hold on to this life that we're going to lose anyway? And if we came to the end of our life and we had given everything away, that we had forfeited our soul, what would we do to get it back? And the answer is, is we would give everything. So if that's going to be the case then, what should it be now? Help us to deny ourselves follow you because father what we do now has eternal impacts and, and lord we don't understand that <laughs> we can't really get our head around that but you just made that so plain to us that we can't be ashamed of you that we have to proclaim you that we have to not just be a jesus consumer but we must be a jesus Father, I pray for encouragement. I pray for that person that's here today, Father, that has that decision before them right now. That they're just looking it right in the face. And, and Father, maybe this has been the opportunity. Maybe this has been the time when they're able to look at that and say, I don't need to do that. I've got to deny myself that. I know it's more money. I know, Father. Help us to make the right decision. Help us to make the right decision. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Father, you know how we need to respond to this message. You know how we need to reflect on it. Father, you know the decisions that we need to make. Father, I pray. And I pray that you'll just guide us in this time of reflection and invitation. Help us to respond to you, Father. Help us to deny ourselves and be true followers of the one true King. We pray this, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.